the guy from South Africa. That's just easier to say. And uh, let's see. So you met the Perkins. Is Darren and Denise still here? Are they in the room? Darren and Denise, did we make them mad? Well, good. <coughs> Hold their check this month. Yeah. We're going to Mazatlan for lunch with all the missionaries after this service. So if you want to come have lunch with us, um, come and join us at Mazatlan Grill. I'm, I'm really tired of the Nazarenes taking up most of the place. So <laughs> we're going to go shove them out. No, I'm just, just teasing. If you want to join us at Mazatlan Grill. Please come join us. So this is my brother Jit, Jit, the guy from South Africa, and he brought a wife from South Africa and his daughter, Kanya. 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 Well, I should have interviewed her. I can say her name. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to pray for him, and then he's going to share God's word. Father, what a joy it is to be part of your kingdom. What a joy it is to know that in the four corners of the world, in many villages, in outbacks, and Father, that there are people proclaiming Jesus and preaching his death and resurrection this very morning. Thank you, Father, for Jit and Mignon. Thank you for the precious baby that you have blessed them with. Father, now as he shares the truth of your word with us, may God, we not walk away and say, wow, it's good to hear from the missionary. May we walk away and say, God, you have spoken to me, and I need to look at my life a little more closely and see what you have for me and my family. So, Lord, bless us in this room. Bless the other churches in our community. We are grateful to stand with them and proclaim this kingdom of God. Lord, you are a good God, and we are so undeserving of what we have. Will you bless my brother as he now shares the fire in his heart? And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen Thank you so much. Well, let's, let's try this, uh, see if you guys can do it better than the previous two services. Goeiemorgen. That's good. Let's, let's, let's try the g first. Goeiemorgen. There we go. Give yourselves a hand. That's very good. I think the first the first service, they were still asleep, but you guys did, did really well. Uh, that's actually also how you say my name, the, with a ch and a r. So my name is Gerhard Dievenhage. Amen. Amen. <laughs> no one wants to try that. Yeah, so that's why I go by Jit, so you guys can, can call me Jit. And it's okay because in South Africa they call me that as well, because um, the people that we work with, that's Picosa, you know, the clicking language. They can't say Gerat either. Um, actually, a funny side story. I, I came to the States a while ago to Hume Lake to, to, sp to speak there, and they actually gave me a new name. They, they called me Osof, um, not Olaf, Osof. Um, and they said, because it stands for our South African friend, because they just didn't try my name at all. So it's okay, you can, you can call me whatever. Um, it's such a privilege for me to be here this morning. My wife and, and, and Kanya, uh, they're not here in the service right now. She's, she's a little tired, so she's taking a nap, uh, baby is. Uh, While well, parents are as well because she had a, a busy night. But uh, it's such a privilege just to be associated with this church, to be on your team. Uh, we believe that the Great Commission is a, is a team effort. Uh, whether you are out on the foreign field or, or sit, being here in, in Susanville in your own field, because it's a mission field in itself, um, but, but being supported through prayers, through finances, uh, just like Bill and Jane said, you, you guys won't realize how much that means to us. Um, knowing that as you are on the front lines, you've got a team of people that are there with you in spirit, even though it's not physically, um, it, it means the world. To be on that missions board uh, is, is such a privilege for us. And, and I want to also say thank you. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Uh, thank you, church, for being missional in Susanville itself, seeing the, the announcement, the church activities that's going on. It really shows us that 
you know, I don't need to come here and preach a missional message because this church gets it. Um, and and it, it's such a privilege to, to, to know that and to be able to share from that platform. The, the missions team standing up here earlier, uh, I, I feel like such a, such a you know, baby or a midget when I look at people serving for 18 years on a missions committee or serving 20 years in, in Romania and, and, and Japan. And, and it's, it's, that's why I feel so humbled to stand here the mo- this morning, even to share what we've learned, mostly through our mistakes, um, but, but to know that, man, there are, there are giants in this in this building today um you know and and in our lives i mean through the pains you know their son phil Payne, who's also a missionary supported by this church he is the one that woke me up to to missions globally um and so that's just amazing to see that generational you know impact um coming down this morning i i want to share about jesus enough for our world you know we live in a world where if we look at the news and we we read the newspapers uh we can just more and more get to a place where where we don't have any hope anymore we we see the brokenness we hear the stories Uh, and so when we when we make a statement like jesus enough for our world uh, it is an important statement because as Christians, we are called to live this out. Many Christians live actually the opposite of this, of this statement. Um, where where they, they walk and they, they don't have hope anymore. And, and, and they want to give up. I'm sure many of us in this, in this church today uh, wonder about the future and think, Oh man, you know, God... Is it, are you really still there? Are you really enough for the pain out there? And so this morning is going to be challenging. And, and I've even just preparing this message, I've been challenged. Because there's been many times I've been overwhelmed by, by the world. And thinking, oh my gosh, where are we headed? But then to go, go back into God's Word and, and to look into, into Jesus and to the cross and what the cross stands for. Being overwhelmed by, by that. And you realize the, the mountain of a challenge in this world becomes a little pebble when we consider who Jesus is. And we come through that perspective. And so we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of digging this morning. Firstly, looking at the world. Because for us to be able to say, Jesus, enough for our world, we need to understand the world if we want to be accurate. And so... We're going to look at the realities, and we're going to be uncomfortable a bit. So I want to, no, I don't want to apologize, because it's, it's the, the, the reality out there. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video, um, and it's, it's for us to know the realities. And so look at this video, and then, and then we'll get to the, to the good part after that.
where is God in this mess, in this chaos? It's what many, many people ask. That last slide there, that is the reality of what some people think. Where is God? Why, why does God allow all of this? Um, in South Africa, I can talk the whole morning about the needs. I didn't move to South Africa. My family has been there for generations. We, we are African. Growing up in a time where we transferred from apartheid, the bad system of racial segregation, to a new South Africa, democracy, I, I remembered the, the, the struggle. Um, and it was so easy to live in a little bubble, like it is easy anywhere to live in a bubble and be ignorant and oblivious of what's, what the pain is. But I remember as a kid um, just hearing, hearing stories and, and, and seeing on the TV, you know, uproars and asking myself and asking my parents, why? Um, am I, for me to be this skin color and that person to be this skin color, why is it wrong that we can be friends? God birthed a, a, a burden for, for racial reconciliation in my heart as a boy. And I can go on and on and, and share about needs going on, poverty and, and HIV and AIDS, where one out of five people have AIDS in South Africa, of, of children that we work with that, that have lost parents and where older kids have to take care of, of younger kids because there, there is no parent around. So they have to be a parent as a 15, 16 year old. Sharing with some of the, the, the previous services that uh, I recall a story of, 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 a, of a family of, of kids where a teenager had to be the, the leader, the parent. And there was no food in the house because at a certain time of the month, you know, the government grant has, has dried up. And so what they need to do is they need to be take initiative of how they're going to feed the kids. And so what they would do is they would keep boiling water at night and they'll pour in the pot on the fire, boil water, boil water, boil water, and just keep doing this until the kids would fall asleep um, with that hope of, of there's going to be a meal. They'll just fall asleep. And, and again, stories and stories of, of that, of, of, of children living in poverty, children as, as AIDS orphans, um, but it's not far away. Even here in the U.S., you can go on and talk about the realities of brokenness, of abuse. Um, quickly went online and saw a statistic that um, a big amount of people in the U United States um, are, are being abused. Children, 6.3 million children annually are victims of child abuse in the U.S.A. Children as young as 12 are being trafficked into human slavery, sex trafficking. 40% um, men have hit their partners. One out of four people, this is globally, four, one out of four ladies have been raped. Um, and again, I can go on and on. Today in the 21st century, what's going on? Last year was marked the biggest year of global persecution of Christians. Open Doors did a study on that. Right now, 100 million Christians are facing global persecution today as we speak. And so as you, as you think about the realities of, of the chaos out there, no wonder some people just want to give up and say, you know what, there's no hope. But then what, what happens in God's heart? We look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God looked at this world and the mess that we're in because we put ourselves in that mess. God gave us free choice. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death and that there's no, there's no way out. There's no hope if it, if it weren't for Jesus. Jesus, God said, that's, that's not the end. I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to take initiative and I'm going to send my son so that there can be a way out of their mess, 
so that they can decide to rise up against this. Because there's life in me if they choose me. He gave us a way out. So that they who believe in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's plan for saving this world is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because of His love. I want to invite you this morning to to embark on me with a journey um, into God's Word in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17. Uh, this This is an amazing passage that takes just hope together for us in in a few verses. Paul wrote this from prison, and he wrote this to the church of Colossa. And Paul has never been to Colossa, but his convert, a guy called Epaphras, he's planted this church. And so as Paul was in prison, you know, he heard the reports of, of how the church was growing, but soon false teaching crept in. False ideas of, of, of Greek thought and, and secularism and, and, and paganism crept in. And soon people said, you know what? Yes, Jesus, but also 1, 2, and 3. Um, relativ- relativism crept in. And, and Paul confronted these ideas and brought them back through his letter to the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And even though there's not, you know, Zeus outside here um, in Susanville or, you know, some Greek temples, um, I think we can put ourselves in their shoes. You know, idols, whether it's, it's, you know, Hollywood or materialism or whatever, so easily uh, we, we combined Jesus and this and this and this. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to read what Paul said to this church in his letter. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things on heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in Him, every, that, so that in everything, He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood. Shed on the cross. How powerful is that? For those people out there that say Jesus is not God, well, take that, suckers. <laughs> he is. He's been there from the beginning. He is God. So I want to I invite you just briefly to, to break down this a bit in four points. As we consider this statement and, and as we ask the question, well, is Jesus enough for this world that we just looked at? Well, as they say, you know, put on your seatbelts because I'm going to show you. First of all, He's the supreme creator. Note in verse 16 that all things were created by Him and for Him. I love how the NIV uh, study Bible in, in, in the commentary, it says there, Jesus was the creating agent through, he was the agent through which God created the universe. And I love that idea. Just thinking that, that Jesus was, was right there. He was involved. God created him um, through Jesus. In, by him and for him. He's also the owner of the universe. Note in verse 15 that he's the firstborn over all creation. In other words, like a prince in a royal family, he was the, the heir to the throne. He's, he's the one that, that basically was, was in charge um, and the owner of, of everything. So there's copyright all over this earth. Jesus is the owner. 
firstborn over, over all creation. And this is not only the earth. Isaiah 40 says it so beautifully. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. I don't know if you ever heard Louis Giglio and some of his teachings, but I love that. He always makes you feel so small. He does this whole study on, on, on the Milky Way and the universe, and then he points to planet Earth when he really you know, shows how, how big, you know, a little speck of dust, planet Earth. And then we think about, man, this is so big, the, the needs, and, and this is not too, too big for God. And you realize, well, planet Earth, you know, is really a speck of dust. We're really, really, really small. God calls the stars at night by name. He is very, very big. I love Job 38 and 39. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm overwhelmed by the need, I sometimes just read it. You know, he speaks, God speaks to Job and just say, you know, who's this who questions my counsel? You know, brace yourself like a man. I'm about to ask you some questions. And then every time I read it, I'm just like, okay, I'm really small. God's really big. You know, he asks questions like, where were you, you know, when I put all of this together? Do you know where, where the, the sun goes down? And, and it's just got beautiful imagery there, Job 38, you know. The, I provide the prey for the lions, you know. Um, and just goes on and on, beautiful imagery of, of how big he is. Um, many of us understand this and we, we understand that he's a creator and we, we learn from Sunday school times um, that he, he holds the universe in his hands. Well, do you know that even the dictators in Africa, even the terrorists, Adolf Hitler, all of these guys, God created them? God is very, very big. He owns everything. I'm going to move on. He is the eternal sustainer. Note in, in verse 17, he says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. We sang as kids, we sing, you know, He holds the, the whole earth in His hands. Um, and, you know, many of us, Sometimes when you look at the, the world, we think, is he really still in charge? We think, God, um, do you see this? What's happening down there? Hello? Or we think, man, maybe he's burnt out by the sins of mankind. As if he's dependent on our behavior. He is not dependent on us. He does not need us. The realities of this world, it does not shake Him. He is the supreme God. It moves His heart so much that God sent Jesus. When Jesus was on earth, He wept. He was moved with compassion. It affects His heart, but He's not dependent on the earth and by our sins. We are dependent on us. He's the one that, that writes. He's the great story writer. He's the one that has seen kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Princes come into power, presidents, the Wall Street, you know, um, now I forgot the name in English. Andela Beers, stock exchange, you know, stuff, whatever. He knows the economies, the, the, the everything. He's seen it. He, he's not shaken. He's the one that puts our food on the table. He's the one that's put the money into our accounts. He's the one that puts the, the sun up and brings it down. We are dependent on Him. Love, Isaiah 40, 22 to 24. He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. I love in in um, Romans 13 verse 1 who it says that you know the authorities have been established by God all leadership Proverbs 21, 21 verse 1 the king's heart is like a stream of water in the hand of the Lord he guides it wherever he pleases 
God is the one that calls the shots. And He's got no equal. He's got no competition. There's no one that's going to come and take away um, this role of being sustainer. Um, thirdly, He's the victorious saver. This is my favorite one. Just because we look at the cross and we think about, you know, Jesus, when He died on the cross, He said, it is finished. He referred to, I have overcome death once and for all. For past sins, for present sins, I have got the enemy under my feet. He's the firstborn from among the dead, verse 18. He's the first one that has resurrected. He didn't stay in the, in the grave there. He resurrected and proved his power over death, over the material world. He has thrown the whole physics upside down. Um, he has shown that he is the victorious one. Verse 19, through him to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He made victory accessible for me and you through his finished work on the cross. In this world, we can have peace. We can have shalom, wholeness in him. He has made that possible for us through his work on the cross. I love the, the song which says, Oh death, where is your sting? Our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. He's under our feet. We know Revelation. We read it. We know what is the end of the story. How the enemy is still in this world. He's still fighting war. He's still causing um, bad stuff to happen. But we know at the end what's going to happen. We've seen the chapters. We read that he is the one. He's going to come and it's going to be a big celebration. And he's going to fetch his bride and it's going to be a big, big celebration. I want to share you a little bit of a, a story here. Um, this is the cross in Cape Town, the southern tip of South Africa. That's where I live. That's our campsite. And so 12 years ago, we planted this cross um, as, as young people. Uh, we were passionate about, about Jesus and making Him known across Africa. And, and what we did is we carried the cross over Table Mountain and we planted it on our campsite. Um, we think it's the most southern cross in, in Africa. And we planted the cross pointing north. Because as, as young people on that camp, we said, God, break our hearts for the things that's breaking your heart. We want to carry your cross for Africa. And we said, the cross of Jesus for the cross of Africa. You know, the cross of, of Africa being the, the pain and the, 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 the need, the hopelessness, the poverty, the many, many things. And we know no government is going to solve that. No government is going to give this freedom, this hope, this life. It is in the cross of Jesus. And so we pointed it pointing north and we said, Jesus, we know what your cross stands for, the hope, the peace, the reconciliation, the life. We know that's the answer for Africa and for this world. And so we planted this cross. A couple of years later, there was a fire on Table Mountain. And we were so scared that, that the cross was going to burn down because uh, a few years earlier we had, a, cro we had a, a, a fire and it took away one of our buildings on the campsite. And so I remember 3 o'clock this morning we got a phone call. I still lived with my parents about an hour away and they said, listen, there is a fire. You better come through. So we drove and I was just thinking in my mind, what has happened to the cross? Because it's wood. It's up there. The fire's coming down. So after hours of of, of fighting fire, um, eventually it was killed. We had uh, helicopters come. Um, and I, I just thought, man, is the cross still standing? And I ran up there, and I just saw ashes and smoke. And I thought, man, is the cross still standing? And as I ran up there, up to the cross, and I saw, you know, the clouds, I mean, the, the smoke just kind of opening up, I saw the cross standing and it is burnt all around it and this was just 
in my spirit, I just knew, God, this is what it's about. And it's as if He just asked me, Jet, this world around, the darkness that you see, the, the brokenness, do you know that, that my cross is still standing? And my cross will forever stand? My cross has been there. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what we do every, every camp, we take kids up there. You know, some camp, we have people, Hindu, Islam, whatever, and we, we take them up there and we share about the story of the cross. Kids from, from, from some of the rural areas and the townships where, where, where there's a big need and they struggle and they've maybe never really experienced God's love. We take them up there and we ask them, what does it look like in your life? Is it ashes in your family? Well, guess what? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about His cross. His arms on that cross was open, and His arms are open today. He's alive. And in Him, we can have life in abundance today in this broken world. And so His cross is ever standing. Fourthly, He's the head of the church. Verse 18 says, He is the head of the body, the church. Many of us understand the previous three, three points. Because we believe in, in Jesus, we believe in God, but we don't believe in His body. We think, yeah, God, I, I know you died on the cross. I know um, you are all powerful, but the vehicle you've chosen, the church, because you see, when, when Jesus was standing on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and He told those nobodies in the world's eyes that, guys, my time's finished. All authority belongs to me. Now you go, make disciples, continue. Here's the baton. You carry on. I bet some people are thinking, oh my gosh. Peter? Really? I mean the way he already messed up? Exactly. I love in the in the Romania video the, the, the young guy that said, you know, um, because I'm I am i am young and maybe that's exactly why God wants to use me, because there's nothing I can boast of, so to speak. It must be God working through me. I mean, we think about the church and we look around this room and we think, Rick? I mean, really? <laughs> Jesus? Well, guess what? God looks at me. He looks at Rick. He looks at you. He looks at Peter. In our brokenness, in our, you know, with our mistakes. And he says, this is my plan. And that, that blows my mind that he actually believes in us. And he doesn't just believe in us. He's, that's his plan. Of course he doesn't need us. We know that. He's God but He wants to use us, and that is His game plan. He's not going to come up with a plan B. His master strategy for getting the cross of Jesus to the cross of this world, the need of this world, is through me and you. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's His plan. He's not going to come up with a new plan. The church is His plan. And so, Paul also said, all this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Jesus is the director of the church. He is the captain of the ship. And His crew, that's me and you. He's empowering us. He's giving us the privilege of reconciling, of carrying this message of peace, of shalom, and helping to reconcile people with God. And Jesus is that, is that bridge. He is the one that connects. I don't know where you are at. Um, and today I don't want to make this a, a head thing. 
because this statement, Jesus, enough for our world, we need to receive it by faith. Amen. My prayer for, for you this morning is to become to a place where you can be still and know that He is God. He will be exalted among the nations, exalted in the earth. He is the one that sits on the throne. Doesn't matter what it looks like around me. The needs in South Africa, the needs in Susanville. Jesus is supreme. May we know in an intimate place in our relationship with Him, may we know this. Let me ask you a question. Are you more overwhelmed by the world than you are overwhelmed by God? Many times I've been there and I still have to fight that. To come back to a place of God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at you first before I look at the, the mountain of a need. Because if I, if I look to you and I know your love and I'm rooted in your love, this becomes so small. Because I know how big my daddy is. How does it show in your life? May we be a church, may we be Christians that show this in our lives. That Jesus is enough for our world. That we can go into situations where God is putting us in and that we can be witnesses of this truth. That Jesus is superior. Jesus is enough. In Jesus is true peace. How does it show in our life, in Susanville? Does Susanville see this in us? I want to pray for us this morning. Um, and yeah, let's, let's pray. Jesus, thank you that that tomb did not stay empty. Thank you that as you rose, you told those guys, uh, the, 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 um, the, the angels told those guys, He has risen, just as He said. He's victorious. God, in this world, as we, we know we've been in the end times for a long time, but as we get closer and closer to the end times, Your Word says, Lord, that it will get, get bad and worse. But thank You for the promise, Lord, that that you are with us and that you are the victorious one and you are the one that they want to use us to share this in this dark world. You want us to be the light carriers. God, may we believe in ourselves as a church. Believe that, God, you have planned it this way and you are the one empowering us to share your victory in this dark world. God, may we pray, may we, we be a praying church that call on you, the King of Kings, as we pray for the world. God, we also read in, in Revelation that there will be peoples of every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping you. That's your vision, Lord. May that be our vision as well. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the missional heart. I pray that that heart will just continue growing to see your kingdom come. And God, may they, they be faithful, continue to be faithful of that here in Susanville um, and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jit. We're going to uh, take an offering in just a minute and we'll talk about that. But this morning I've heard jet speak three times and every time god said something different to me i hope he said something to you but here's what it is for me this service will i not you not even including you in what god told me but will i be as passionate for the cross in susanville as jit is passionate for the cross in south africa that's but that's me that's what i got to arm wrestle with so this morning, I'm just asking you a similar question. As this dear brother and his family pursues the kingdom of God with his youthfulness, with his um, daughter in his arm, in a city 
or in a country that has known nothing but apartheid for centuries and just recently experienced democracy and freedom. Will we proclaim that cross here? Well, everybody in America knows the cross. No, they don't. American children know more about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus than they do the resurrection and the birth of Jesus Christ. So, with that said, we're going to take an offering for the ministry called Jubilani African Ministries. And what I'm going to do is, Jed didn't talk about that because we asked him to preach. He talked about their ministry last night. But I want him to tell you the purpose statement of their ministry. And when you hear this, you'll understand it. So yeah. do that for us, brother. Quick fact, a third of South Africa um, are young people under the age of 15 uh, because of HIV and AIDS that have taken away a, a whole generation. Um, so they are not only tomorrow's leaders, they're today's leaders already. Um, just over the last few months, the township shanty that's five minutes away from us, about 40 young people, 13, 14, 15 year old, that, that became very involved with gang violence killing each other, major war, and these were 13, 14, 15-year-old kids. So they are the ones that, that are already taking the lead. So what we do is we train and disciple young Africans in becoming godly servant leaders. Because that's a huge deal in Africa. Foreign concepts. Leadership is dictatorship. Um, many leaders are corrupt. And so our heart is to raise up a generation of servant leaders with godly character and integrity that can share God's message in their own communities. Not you know, realizing that God has placed me in my community. I can be a big brother to some of these little kids. I can make a change. I can take ownership of my own village, my own um, shanty town. So that's what we do, uh, raising and, and training young Africans to be godly servant leaders in their own communities. Do that through camps. Uh, we love camping ministry. Four different campsites all over the country. We also believe in follow-up. So after these camps, we go and visit these kids in their communities. We go deep in discipleship, um, going through God's Word, the teachings of Jesus, discipling one-on-one -on -one and training them as leaders. Thirdly, we do that through partnerships. That's what I love about this church as Rick was praying for the other churches. Also, this is a team effort. We are the body, and so we, we help other churches um, to, to be missional also in their own community because there's broken young people all over. And so partnerships is a huge deal. And then fourthly, we've got uh, teams that we work in. These, all of the work we do are all volunteers. And so we've got um, short-term teams that come. We, we are trusting God 2017. Uh, to, to bring a team out from, from this church to come to South Africa. Uh, and so we, we work with teams. We do summer internship programs. And then we've got a year-long discipleship program where we do have students from the States coming for a whole year, but we also have young people from the communities that we work in, the villages. As we disciple, we, God points out leaders, some of these young leaders that really have potential, and we invite them to spend a year with us, live with us on our base. Uh, we work through books um, like Wild at Heart, you know, some C.S. Lewis um, Bible doctrine, and we, we build a good foundation um, for them throughout the year. Um, part of this year is also running camps and going to the outreach and doing different things with the idea of sending them back at the end of the year, um, to be a witness in the community. And, and that is what the offering this morning will go towards. We've got about three young people that have applied for next year from these villages that we still need um, sponsors for. And it works out about $350 a month for, to have a student. And so we're going to um, use this funds towards... Um, the fee for having one of these these young people spend a year with us. And so, um, yeah, in short, that's what Amen. we're about. Amen. So wouldn't it be great if we could fund those three students? Be awesome. So we're going to uh, take an offering. Carlin's going to pray.
we're going to ask Bill and Jane, and you can go if your wife's available, get be at the door. Rick and Gwen, you can be at the door. Find Darren and Denise to be at the door. Whoever wants to be at the door can, can be at the door today. So uh, anyway, give as you always do. You're a giving church. You're a gracious church. We want to support our brother in this ministry. Let's stand together, sing with Carlin. You'll bless us, and we'll head to Matzatlan and chase out the Nazarenes. Amen. <laughs>